Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, culture seminar. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Leo Jimenez from Ohio State University. And he will speak about differential algebraic permutation groups and applications. Okay, uh, thanks Ronnie and uh, yeah, thanks to all of the organizers uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to speak in the Cochin Seminar. Um, right, so before I start, uh, I just want to say two things. The first is that this is joined with uh, James Freitag and Rahim Musa. Uh, and the second is that I'm primarily a model theorist. Um, so I've tried to sort of, you know, remove most of the sort of model theoretic language from the talk, um, but there will be some leftover and at some point I might say things that are, I don't know, mysterious, so please interrupt me and I might also spend time on things that look trivial. Okay, that might also happen and if that is the case, sorry. Um, okay, so let me get started. Um, so just some setup um, before I get to it. So in this talk, I will always consider differential fields, right? So I think everyone is familiar with that. Fields with a derivative satisfying Leibniz rule. Uh, and then we have an analog of algebraically closed fields, which are differentially closed fields. Any differential equation that has a solution in some field has a solution in a differentially closed field. Um, and then we have the Korchin topology, which is an analog of the Zariski topology. Uh, and zero set, right? Closed sets are zero sets of systems of differential equations. Sometimes they're called delta varieties. Um, and then we have also an analog of constructible sets, and these are called definable sets, Boolean combinations of Korchin closed sets. And this also gives us definable maps, right? Maps whose graph is definable. Okay, and so this is usually the point of view of model theory is to work with definable sets. So usually I will talk about definable sets today. Um, okay, and for the issues that I will talk about, parameters are very important. So any core chain or definable set, many parameters from some differential field K to be defined. And in that case, we say that it is defined over that field K. Okay. Um, now, in model theory, we like to work with something we call saturated domains and that you can think of as being, uni so, sorry, saturated models, which you can think of as being universal domains in a way. Um, right, so it's like, the difference between C and Q alg, both are algebraically closed fields, but sometimes it is easier to work with the complex numbers to get, you know, generic points, for example. So something similar happens in differential algebra. Um, and by that, I mean, it is convenient usually to work in a saturated differentially closed field, which I will call mathcal U. Okay, and what this means is, if K is the cardinality of U, and I have a system of differential equations and inequations, of size strictly less than kappa, this cardinal C, and it has a solution in some extension of that field, right, some differential extension, then it has a solution in you already. Okay, um, so, you know, by analogy with algebraically closed fields, C is saturated, but QAlg is not, All right? So for the rest of this talk, I will fix such a saturated differentially closed field uh, in which all of my other fields and all solutions to differential equations, everything will be happening in that field, okay? And so you can think of this as like universal domain for differential algebra, right? That's kind of, let's take the model theoretic way of doing differential algebra. Um, okay, and I will also fix math, math cal C, which, uh, oh, right, there's a typo here. This should be delta of X equals zero, not X, my bad. Uh, right, so it's the field of constants, the, the elements that have derivative zero. Okay, and usually there's no harm in thinking of this as the complex numbers. Okay, most of the time you can think of this as the complex numbers and there would be no harm. Okay, now, right, and in this talk I will talk a lot about differential algebraic group actions, meaning group action described by algebraic differential equations. Okay. So here's a vague question about differential equations, right, that I'm gonna make precise in a little bit. So fix some differential subfield K of my saturated differential field U, and then I consider two distinct algebraic differential equation that I write 
as just a polynomial in y, delta of y, up to delta n of y, and then another polynomial q of y, delta y, delta m of y. Okay? And I assume, moreover, that these polynomials are irreducible. Okay, so the question that I'm going to want to answer today is, is there some differential algebraic relation between a typical tuple of solutions of P and some tuple of solution of Q, okay? And can we bound the number of solutions we need to look at to find such a relation, right? So I want to know if I take like solutions of P, typical in a sense that I'll define soon, is there some relation with some solutions of Q, right? And how many do I need on this side to witness the relation, okay? All right, so this is kind of a vague question, so let me now make it precise. <clears throat> so just, just a bit of notation, if I have some set A in U, I let K of A be the differential field generated by A and K. Okay, now if I have two tuples, A bar, which is A1 through AN, and B bar, which is B1 through BM, I say that they are independent over K. If for all natural number D, the transcendence degree of A bar, delta A bar, delta D bar over KB bar is the transcendence degree of A bar, delta A bar, delta D A bar over K. Okay, so in other words, if I add B to my parameters, I don't change the transcendence degree, okay? I don't get any new polynomial relation between A, its derivative K and B. Okay, so this means there's no new relation. Okay, so that sort of defines precisely one of the things that was vague in the previous slide. Okay, and the other definition is what I mean by a typical solution. So if I have some differential equation P of Y delta Y delta N of Y equals zero, then a generic solution of P equals zero is a solution such that the differential ideal um, of polynomials such that P of A equals zero is the differential ideal generated by P. I guess this should be Q's in, the, in these brackets, right? Not P. This is not the same P in the curly bracket. Right. So basically, this tuple A, this, the equations that it satisfies are just the ones specified by saying P equals zero and no more, right? So this is like a typical solution, one that does not satisfy any extra relation. Okay, so yeah. now that we have these two definitions. Uh, sorry um, to interrupt. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no there, there seemed to be a slight delay between your slides and when you're speaking. Oh, how long is it? Uh, maybe uh, sometime. So I think what you could do is click twice and I think it'll show up for us. But then maybe you won't see what you're reading. Okay, okay, so I'm going to click twice now. All right, try. Oh, sorry. Right, now we see your current slide. Uh, consider two distinct polyn differential equation. Okay, so okay, it's a, a few seconds. Okay, I'll try to take that into account for the rest of the talk. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, no, it's okay. Okay, right, so, so for my next talk, so here's the precise question. Uh, and for the more theorists in the audience, I'm really talking about non-weak orthogonality here uh, between a type and a definable set. So consider again, are two distinct differential equations. Okay, uh, so the same ones that we started with. <clears throat> okay, and now for any integer k, consider this following condition, which I call dk, uh, which is that for any L in N and for any A1 through AK generic and independent solution of p equals zero, and for any B1, BL solution of q equals zero, the tuples A1 through AK and B1 through BL are independent over K. Okay, so that's the condition. And notice that it's not a symmetrical condition, right? I don't ask anything of the B1 through BL except being solutions of Q equals zero. Okay, and so the question is, is there a constant K depending on M such that DK implies DK prime for all K prime greater or equal to K? Right. In other words, can we make sure that after we checked for k solutions, there's also no relation for any k prime greater than k, right? 
when do we know that we've checked for large enough tuples? Okay, so uh, you know, a classic, very basic example, um, if you consider the two definable sets, so one being the constants and one being the set of solutions of delta, delta x minus x equals zero. So you can prove that any constant and any generic point of x are independent, right? So we have the condition D1. On the other hand, there is a differential group action, right, from the constant on x given by multiplication, and it makes k, sorry, it should be x here, makes x into a principal homogeneous space, okay? And therefore, for any two generic independent a, b in x, there is a unique c, a constant such that b equals c times a, right? So, of course, then, a and b are not independent over the constant. This is like a new relation that we didn't have before, right? So in this case, we have D1, but we don't have D2. Okay. Another example is uh, if we consider these two definable sets. So again, we have the constant, and then we have this set X given by this equation. Okay, so we have a fact, um, I think. Rosenlich did it first, and then Ruchowski et also did prove this for much broader class of examples. I'm just giving one example here, um, which is that if I take any tuple of constants and any generic independent a1, ak, and x, these two tuples are independent. Okay, so we have dk for all k, right? Okay, so this, you know, of course, this was known for a long time. You know, it's not a result that due to us is just an example. But the question is, how long do we, how do we know that we've checked for a large enough k? Right, so that's one example where how do you know that it's true for all k? Okay, so that's the sort of sort of question that I want to answer in sort of a theoretical manner today. And uh, so question, yeah. why would yeah. we not want to know uh, if this is true for larger uh, k? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Why would we want to know the larger k? Why would we want to know? Yes. Um, well, I, I, I mean, you know, because we care about differential equations having relations between them, I think is the bottom line here. But um, yeah. Right, I mean, it's sort of like, is there any relation at all between like generic solutions of one equation and solutions of the other, right? So I, I, I think this, this question is interesting, right? If you want to understand differential equations. Um, but that's the motivation. I, I, I cannot give further motivation. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so here's a rough idea of what we'll do. Um, right, so what we'll do is we'll use differential algebraic group actions to show that for any two definable sets, X and Y, including the examples that we've seen, of like the equations that we've seen before, there is some k natural number depending only on x, such that if x and y do not satisfy dl for some l, then x and y do not satisfy dk, right? And in other words, dk implies dl for all l, right? So once we've checked for that k, that there's no relation, we know that there's no relation at all, ever. Okay, so that's the plan. Okay, so for that, I want to use automorphism groups. So pick any two definable set defined over k. There's the group of automorphism of the monster model fixing k and y. And I can restrict its action to x. And I write this as odd of x over y in k, or odd of x over y when k is implicit. OK, and the two key observations are that, first, this group can be assumed to be differential algebraic for the problem I care about and that we can then use this group to bound the set of L such that DL is true, okay? And for that, we'll use basically knowledge about differential algebraic group and knowledge about algebraic group. So that's the rough plan. Okay, um, so for that, I need to talk a bit about internality. So this is a notion that comes from model theory. So for any two definable set X and Y defined over K, I said that X is internal to Y if there is some definable subjective map F from some power of, of Y to X. 
And the key point of the definition is that the map needs extra parameters, okay? It's defined over some field extension. And so this could be, for example, right, the basis of a Picard Vesio extension, right? You know, familiar example. Uh, but this is much more general than that. Okay, and so, you know, a concrete example is the one we've seen before, right? Where the solutions of dx equals x and the constants, we can define a map from the constant to x, taking c to c times a, for some a in x, right? And this is a subjective map, but we need the parameter in x. Okay, um, right, so now I want to talk about Galois groups. So the fact from model theory, but I think is also well known to a different differential algebraist, is that if x and y are defined over k and x is internal to y, then the action of odd x over y on x is isomorphic to a differential algebraic group action. Okay, and that means that all the tools from differential algebraic groups can come into play to help us do things. Okay, and so in the previous example, uh, all of x over y is just the multiplicative group of the constants acting on x by multiplication, right? I mean, we've seen that uh, in the previous slides. Okay, so the question is, this is all, you know, it's all great, but uh, how do we, you know, make sure that we have internal sets, right? This only works for internal sets. Um, so the way we do this is, Suppose we have, again, our two differential equations, and we know that dl is false for some l, but we don't know which l, right? And then we let x and y be the set of solutions of p and q. Okay, and then if dl is false for some l, then there is a k-definable map f from x to x tilde with x tilde internal to y. Okay? And the point here is that if dl is false and the definable set x tilde and for the definable set x tilde and y, then it is also false for x and y. Okay. So in a sense, for this specific problem, we can just assume that the set x is internal to y. And from that, we do get this differential algebraic group action of out of x over y on x. Okay, so now we have our differential algebraic group action, and this is where we can now use some notions from model theory. Um, and in particular, uh, I'm going to use something called generic transitivity. Okay, so here I'm going to delve a little bit into some model theory. Um, so there is a very general notion of dimension for definable sets in model theory, which is called Morley rank. Um, I'm not going to define it and you don't really need to know precisely what it is to follow what I'm saying here. Um, so here's the definition that I'm going to care about. If G is a definable group of finite Morley rank acting of, on a definable set of finite Morley rank, okay, so finite dimension, then we call this action generically K-transitive if the diagonal action of G on V to the K admits an orbit that is generic in the sense of Morley rank. And by that I mean there is an orbit such that if I remove it from VK, I get something of strictly smaller rank than the rank of VK. Okay, so a very large orbit in the sense of that notion of dimension. Okay, and so the key fact, uh, it's, not, it's not hard to prove, but it's what makes everything work, is that given two definable set X and Y of finite Morley rank, with X being Y internal, the condition DK holds if and only if all of x over y acts generically k-transitively, right? Basically, because acting generically k-transitively means that any generic k-tuple of solutions, of, of realizations of x, can be moved to any other one while fixing y. And so they just look the same with respect to y, so there's no, no new relation happening. Leo, uh, uh, I think uh, we can't see the, the fact you're stating yet. Yes, and we oh. see it now. So maybe uh, oh, wow. one second so that everyone can look at this slide. Okay, okay. Sorry, I, I, yeah, I thought I had the, no. the right amount of pose, but... So is it is it here now? Yeah, it's here now, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ali. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I don't know why there's a delay. Um, 
Okay, so <clears throat> right. So the fact is, if I have two definable set x and y of finite Morley rank, and x is y internal, then DK holds if and only if all of x over y acts generically k transitively. Okay, so if I care about condition DK, I really just have to care about differential algebraic group action and whether or not they act generically k-transitively. All right. Um, now, there's a conjecture in model theory about exactly this, about uh, generic k-transitivity. Okay, so this is due to Borovic and Sherlin. Uh, it's kind of a tough, tough problem, I think. Um, so suppose G is a connected, and by that I mean no definable subgroup of finite index, definable group of finite Morley rank that acts definably, faithfully, and transitively on a set V of Morley rank n strictly greater than zero. If this action is generically n plus two transitive, then GV is definably isomorphic to the natural action of PGLN plus one of F on PN of F for some algebraically closed field F. Right, so once you get high enough degree of generically generic transitivity, you have no choice. You have to be PGLN plus one acting on PN. Okay, so of course, if the borovic charlin conjecture is true, then we get a bound on, uh, on the degree of generic transitivity. Uh, because if I had such a group acting generically n plus three transitively on some set V, well then this group would be definably isomorphic to PGLN plus one of F acting on PN of F, but this action is not generically N plus three transitive, right? So basically proving the, the borovic charlin conjecture bounds the degree of generic transitivity in function of the dimension of the space you're acting on, okay? Which is exactly what we want. Okay, so somehow with all the steps steps we've taken so far, uh, we sort of reduce the problem to proving borovic charlin in differentially closed field. Right, this would be differentially closed field on tops. Um, and so, right, so that's the theorem we proved eventually, right? So uh, this is uh, me, James Freitag, and Ray Musa. So suppose G GNS is a differential algebraic permutation group, and G is connected of finite Morley rank, and the Morley rank of S is n greater strictly than zero. If that action is generically n plus two transitive, then GNS is definably isomorphic to the action of PSLN plus one of C on PN of C. <clears throat> right, and so by the discussion on the previous slide, there is no generically n plus three transitive differential algebraic permutation group, GS with uh, the model rank of S being smaller or equal to N. Right, and so, you know, still unpacking all we've said so far, if for any two definable set X and Y with X internal to Y and the model rank of X is N, the group out of X over Y cannot act generically N plus three transitively, and therefore D of N plus three holds. Okay, so we really have a bound on the number of solutions we need to check to witness some relationship between the two sets X and Y. Okay, and so, you know, let me just restate the result that we've obtained uh, in the language that we had before. So here are two differential equations, uh, the same as before. Okay, I guess the first thing is the Morley rank is less or equal to N. Okay, this is something one can prove. So this is really a bound on, um, Right, so if we have a bound depending on Morley rank, we also get a bound depending on n. Okay, and then this is the definition we had before. And, um, and so the theorem, the final theorem is that dn plus 3 implies dk for all k in n. Okay, so once I've checked that there's no solution, now there's no relation between n plus 3 independent realization independent generic realization of P equals zero, then I know that there is also no relation with realization of Q equals zero, right? I, I know I can stop there. Okay, so, you know, this is sort of a nice result and uh, I, 
I want to uh, sort of explain in the rest of the talk how we prove Borovic Um I think this is a nice proof. It's actually not uh, too difficult. It's like there's a lot of like elementary group theory, so it's kind of fun to do. Um, so I want to talk about it a little bit. Leo, j just to clarify here. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, the n plus 3, uh, can you do better instead of n plus 3, the Morley rank of a set if you knew it plus 3? Yeah, yeah, uh, you can. Um, so this is not the uh, optimal bound. In fact, the optimal bound is in term of the u rank of, of the generic type of p equals 0, I think. And then it's u rank of this generic type plus 3, I think, is the optimal bound. And that's sharp. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how do we prove Barvik Charlin? Um, so the plan, the game plan is we're going to use Barvik Charlin for algebraically closed fields. Um, so this is a theorem of Freitag and Musa, um, which basically states, right, if I take a generically n plus 2 transitive group action defined in a saturated algebraically closed field of characteristic 0, then it has to be isomorphic to PGLN plus 1 of f acting on PN of f, right? So this is borovic charlin for algebraically closed fields. OK, so we want to prove this for differential algebraic group action. And so the main steps are, first, that we're going to show that any definably primitive group action is isomorphic to the action of the constant points of an algebraic group. Um, so I'm going to define what definably primitive means in a second. Um, and then the second step is we're going to show that to prove borovic charlin in DCF0, we can reduce to definably primitive group actions. Okay, and this was essentially done by borovic charlin in one. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about that step B. Um, by essentially, I mean that, okay, we couldn't really understand their proof, and so we, we reproved it, basically. Um, but I think they, they, it's just that it was written in sort of like groups of finite model rank language, and we couldn't follow. Um, okay, and then we use Freitag Musa to conclude, right? Because we've reduced to definably primitive, and then we know it's an algebraic group action, and so then we use that borovic charlin is true for algebraic group actions. So let's see how step A works. <clears throat> so uh, a definable group action, GS, is definably primitive if S admits no non-trivial G invariant equivalence relation. And an equivalent statement is that uh, S is G mod H for H some maximal proper definable subgroup. OK, and I want to point out that, uh, because this was something that we got confused about at some point, this does not need to exist. OK, there does not need to be a maximal proper definable subgroup. OK, so just a warning, right? That it, not, it needs not exist. OK, so let's, let's fix some connected G, some connected group G, and some maximal properly definable subgroup H. And then we let B be the subgroup of G generated by its minimal normal subgroups. Uh, it is definable, and it's called the circle. OK, so this is a result, a model theoretic result, that this group is definable. <clears throat> OK, and so this is where uh, the onan scott theorem of MacPherson and Pillay comes into play. Uh, so this theorem classifies definably primitive group actions using this sub subgroup B, the circle. Okay, and it gives us three possibilities. Um, so the first one is that G is semi-direct product of B with GNL of C, and B in this case is a definable subgroup of C to the N with addition. Okay, so that's already an algebraic group action, right? So we don't need to look at that case further. Okay, the second case is B is the unique minimal normal subgroup of G. It has trivial centralizer and is simple. And the third case is that B is T1 cross T2, where T1 and T2 are the unique two minimal normal definable subgroups of G. Okay, so I want to look at case two. Uh, case three is somewhat similar, just a bit more complicated, but I think case two is sort of, um, you know, it's, it's a nice case to do. So I want to give a bit more details on, uh, on the proof here. Yeah. 
Okay, so the first thing is um, by Cassidy's theorem, um, because B is a simple differential algebraic group, it is definably isomorphic to the constant points of some algebraic group T, right? So that's a theorem of Cassidy. Um, and so, of course, then it would be enough to show that G equals B, right? Because this is what we want, right? We want G to be uh, isomorphic to some algebraic group. Okay. And because G is connected, it has no definable subgroup of finite index. So if we manage to show that G over B is finite, then we win, right? Because that means that G equals B. Okay. So of course, because B is a normal subgroup, G acts on B by conjugation. And because B has trivial centralizer, G actually embeds into odd def of B, which is the subgroup of definable automorphisms of B. OK, and then because B is simple, B is center free, and so B identifies with its group of linear automorphisms. OK, and um, what we conclude from this is that G over B is definably isomorphic to odd def of B over B, right? So, and that is definably isomorphic by stable embeddedness of the constants to the group of algebraic automorphism of T over T. Okay, so this is just a great, you know, this stable embeddedness, embeddedness remark this is for the model theorist, right? You have to use stable embeddedness to show that when, when you go to T, you get algebraic automorphisms, right? There's like a non-trivial step here because basically what you do in the proof is you take <clears throat> you take B and then you send it to T, right, by a definable automorphism. And so you know it's easy to show just by some bit of like diagram chasing that this also sends a definable automorphism of B to a definable automorphism of T. Um, right, but the question is why is that new definable automorphism an algebraic automorphism? Right. Why is it definable in an algebraically closed field? And that's stable embeddedness of the constants. Right. So that's something to do here. OK, but then the key point is that this later group, we know it to be finite. OK, so our L of t over t is finite. Therefore, our def of b over b is finite, which is isomorphic to g over b. Therefore, g over b is finite. And therefore, because g is connected, g equals b. And we're done. Uh, right, and yeah, the second, the third case is really similar, uh, just a little bit more complicated. Okay, so that sort of um, conclude the proof of that case, right? So this is how we do one of the case of borovic chelin Well, this is how we do, you know, one of the case of the reduction of a definable primitive group action to an algebraic group action, right? And then you reduce to definably primitive, and you get borovic chelin OK, and um, in the time that I have left, uh, I want to talk a little bit about like a result that's a bit different, but that's symmetric in the two equation, right? So remember, our result was, was for like some differential equation P and some differential equation Q. Uh, and for P, we picked generic independent solution. But for Q, we had any solution, right? And in particular, we had no bounds on the number of solution of Q we needed to witness a, rela a relation, right? So we would like something symmetric where we have a bound on the number of solutions of Q we need to check and on the number of solutions of Q we need to check. All right, so let's pick the same setup as we had before. And then we consider the following condition, which I call CKL. OK, and it says, for any generic and independent over k solutions a1 through ak of p equals 0 for any generic and independent over k solutions b1, bl of q equals 0, the tuples a1 through ak and b1 through bl are independent over k. Right, so now this is symmetric and this is finite on both sides. Right, the only difference is I ask for the solutions of q to also be generic and independent. OK, so here's the theorem. Um, 
which is that Cn plus 3, M, Cn plus 3, M plus 3 implies Ckl for all Lk. Um, <clears throat> right, and so in other words, if I give you two equations P and Q, if I want to know if there is relations between independent tuples of generic solutions, it's enough to look at n plus 3 of them and m plus 3 of them. Um, and again, um, the bound in terms of the degree of these polynomials is uh, not optimal. Uh, the optimal bound is in terms of the U rank of the generic types of P and Q. Uh, and it's, it's you know, your rank of P plus 3, your rank of Q plus 3, and this is again a sharp bound. Um, okay, and I can, you know, say a bit more about the proof of this. Um, so it relies on a bit more, you know, model theoretic machinery, which is why I, I chose not to present it today. Uh, it relies on Zilber's dichotomy and the domination equivalence decomposition. Okay, and I can say a bit more. Um, basically, you take the generic types of P and Q, of, of these two equations, where you take the two generic types, P and Q, and then if you know that CKL is false for some LK, you know that these types are non-orthogonal in particular. Okay, and then the domination equivalence decomposition gives you that they are non-orthogonal to a common minimal, strongly, a common strongly minimal type T. Okay, and then there's like two cases. If this common non-orthogonal type T is locally modular, you can conclude that the bound is two, right? They, they fork after two realization. And if it's locally modular, if it's non-locally modular, you can assume T is the generic of the constants, right? And basically that means that the relation between P and Q has to go through the constants. And then you use borbic charlin again to bound the degree of generic transitivity of the binding group. Uh, one fun thing is that it doesn't, you know, this result doesn't use borbic charlin for DCF0, just for algebraically closed fields. So that's kind of an interesting thing about this result. Okay, so I think that's all I wanted to say about you know new results uh, and on some questions that I think are interesting to look at next. Um, so the first one is in that theorem, right? What happens if we drop the independence requirement, right? Can we get an absolute bound, right? So here, um, right on the previous slide, if I don't ask that the solutions are independent, but just that they are generic, can we get a better bound? Um, right, so I'm not sure about this. I mean, this is uh, something we've been thinking about a little bit. Uh, we don't know how to do it, um, but it should be uh, an interesting result to get as well. Um, and the other question is, is there a version of this for partial algebraic differential equation? Uh, so this is also something that we may want to do next. Um, and right, the interesting part about this is that it would require some sort of infinite dimensional version of the onan scott theorem. So we've sort of been looking at this also a little bit, and we think that it has a, ch a, ch a chance to work, maybe, maybe, maybe. At least the onan scott maybe could work. Um, OK, so I think I'll stop here for today. So thank you. And uh, here are some references that I gave in the talk. Do we have uh, any questions uh, for you? I have a small question, if I may. OK. Oh, hi. Um, hi. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a, a, a two-part question, but it's really two versions of the same question. If you wouldn't mind going back maybe two or three slides when you had the conditions CKL. Yeah. And, so earlier you mentioned that the the earlier uh, a condition dk was equivalent to uh, if I recall a, a generic k freeness. Mm -hmm. uh, generic uh, k transitivity. Sorry, uh, yeah. Transitivity, right, right. Thank yeah. you. Um, so uh, the the first part is uh, if you could say um, um, a few words about why why these two things are are equivalent. Somehow the the dk condition and this uh, generic k transitivity sound quite different. And then, and then the, the second part is whether this other condition, CKL, can itself be made equivalent to some other sort of transitivity in a similar way. OK, yeah. Um, OK, so I'll answer the first question. Um, so 
so if yeah so if you have this large orbit right this generic orbit for for k tuples say you're generically k transitive then any um generic independent tuple of k solutions is in that orbit um because if you know uh, they have to be in that large orbit because if they were in a small orbit then they would satisfy some relation that would make them not generic uh, not independent okay and so then generic k transitivity tells you that in that orbit i can move any k tuple to any other k tuple right in that orbit but now if you think about what that means is in terms of of like sort of galois group right it means that for any two solutions i can move one to the other while fixing that other set y okay and in particular they have to have exactly the same relation over y okay so they look the same from the point of view of y and because they were generic in the first place that means that they have no extra relation um does that answer the question or, or is it still yes yes thank you okay and so the second question was this uh ckl in terms of a group condition um Yeah, this one I'm not sure about. Um, I, I can't think of the top of my head of, a, of an equivalent condition for this one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? I have one. So in uh, the first the first uh, line of work of uh, James and Rahim, uh, they initially showed something like that. that C, uh, so you know you need n plus three to get independence, but then they realize uh, you just need to check three solutions to get the full independence. Uh, do you expect something of a sort to hold in this case that you don't need to look at C n plus three and C n plus three, or all right. So, if you want to look at generic independent solutions, uh, this is this is optimal. Um, yeah, Jim, Jim, and Rahim have an example where um, where you need to check, you know, your rank of the type plus three to get um, to get some some dependence. Um, but but I think that's the point of that last question, right? Is if we drop the independence requirement, maybe we can get a better bound. Right. Um, but we don't we don't know. Was was this your question or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Good. Oh, and uh, oh, can I show? I see there's a question in the chat. Could you show the Jonas Scott theorem that you reference? Yes, I can do that. Uh, this is the last um, last reference here. All right. Uh, so. If we don't have any more questions, let us thank Leo again. So. Thank you. And thank you all for being here. Uh, let me stop.